Okay, so uh, thanks again for coming uh, to my lecture today, which is the last of the day. Um, so we're going to basically resume where we ended last time. And I also wanted to point out that I provided a last time's lectures yesterday night. Uh, so I send it to Jim, presumably it's on the website in the meantime, but otherwise it's also in a Google Drive. And then I also provided a little handout with all the typing rules for linear logic session types, intuitionistic linear logic session types. Uh, so we haven't seen all of those rules yet. So we, you have a head start in case you've already looked at it, but I'll walk you through it in any case. Okay, so just a quick recap what we discussed last time. So I basically introduced you to the roadmap and learning object, objectives. Uh, so we'll talk about, um, um, yeah, so we talked about message passing concurrent programming and the pi calculus as a formal model uh, that also accounts for non-determinism. And uh, then what we also did is we started uh, to look at session types that were originally conceived by Kohei Honda as really the types of message passing concurrency. And what we saw is that we have to be very careful to maintain preservation in a session type setting because in principle, channels can be shared among several clients. And that gives rise to non-determinism. And also as a result, um, we have to be careful. So without any uh, provisions that we set up, um, type safety doesn't hold uh, just like that. And um, basically there are two extreme solutions if you want. One is to disallow aliasing from the get-go. And that's where we use linear type systems or some form of linearity. And I also wanted to stress that even though we're talking today or in these lecture series about um, linear logic session types, uh, Linear me mechanisms are also employed in the original works by Koei Honda and all the descendants. Uh, but here we're exploring a development that is really firmly rooted in logic. And that's something that we'll discuss further today. So the other extreme then would be to say, okay, uh, there are some applications that need aliasing and so we're not just going to prevent it or disallow it, but we'll, we'll support it, but we control it so that we can still make sure that we get all the good guarantees that we want. Uh, so, and in particular, so, so far, when we started looking into linear logic session types, we looked at an intuitionistic development. And today I also will uh, explain a little bit more what it means to be intuitionistic in this setting. All right, so this is where we'll continue. So we plunge right in. And just as a reminder, so we have uh, introduced the following linear connectives uh, where we have A tensor B, A lolly B, A with B, A plus B and one. And the first two connectives are the multiplicative ones and they have um, the operational semantics of sending and receiving a channel. And then the next two connectives uh, are the branching constructs where that we have where the external choice, the A with B, allows uh, the client to make a choice, whereas the latter, the A plus B, allows the prov provider to make a choice. And we saw both th those connectives actually here in the queue, where the queue allows the client to either choose the NQ label or the DQ label. In case the client chooses NQ, it has to send a channel reference of type A and then the Q uh, recurses. And otherwise, if the client chooses DQ, now the Q tells the client whether it's empty or not. If it's not empty, it will send DQ, basically an element that is stored in the Q. So it will send a channel reference of type A. Then uh, we also have uh, the unit for tensor, which is, which is termination. And that's actually something that we haven't discussed yet. So we'll look at that uh, later. Also, let me briefly remind you of this kind of 
a conceptual mind map that tells you how, um, what kind of typing judgment we use and how to read uh, inference rules. So just as a reminder, uh, uh, here we have an intuitionistic linear judgment where we type the process term, so the program P as indicating that it offers a session of type A along channel A and it is itself a client of the following channels x1 to xn that offer sessions a1 to an. All right. And then we said that we use a sequent calculus based formulation of the type system. So the basic reading of an inference rule in that setting is a bottom up reading when we think about proof construction or uh, type derivations. Uh, so type checking basically. So uh, at the bottom, um, we have the conclusion above, we have the premise. And typically the reading is that P is the current process term that we're executing. And then the continuation is the premise. And then we also saw that basically for each connective that we have in the, in the linear logic or for each type, uh, we have a right rule and a left rule. The right rule is describing the communication from the point of view of the provider. And the left rule is describing the communication from the point of view of a client. All right. Okay, so these are the connectives that we covered last time. So we did actually quite a lot of uh, things, right, last time. Uh, so again, uh, just briefly, so we have the tensor right rule, tensor left rule. So this is channel output. So here the provider sends a channel Y along X. It has a Y in its linear context. And because uh, of linearity, because we track ownership, uh, we are no longer having access to that Y. Uh, the client, on the other hand, receives that channel and then has it in its continuation available. The, the implication, uh, so the linear implication, so Lolly is, is similar just with the role reversed. So let's look at the internal choice. In the internal choice, um, it is the provider that makes a choice. So it, it either in case of a binary choice, it's going to choose the label in left or in right. And uh, then either offers a session A or B and the client that on the other hand has to branch on the choice made by the provider. And again, now for the external choice, uh, it's kind of the roles are reversed. Okay, so now let's look at a connective that we haven't discussed yet. Uh, so let's look at uh, one, which is the multiplicative, uh, the unit for the multiplicative conjunction. And we can think of it as termination. So the operation or computational interpretation of uh, uh, one is termination. Okay, so as you can see here, we are basically, we're offering, so that's the, the right rule. So we're describing the interaction from the point of view of the provider. So the provider is providing a session of type one, meaning that is actually going to close down uh, that, that session. All right, so what happens to the resources that we potentially have in the context? What do you think? Well, again, keep in mind, we want to make sure that we kind of keep track of ownership and there should only be always one client and there should exist a client. So basically what we're insisting is that there cannot be any resources here on the left. So there cannot be any channels because otherwise, if now this process closes down, then we would have some providers who are orphans, basically. They have no client associated with them and we want to prevent that. Okay, so let's look at the left rule now. Uh, so here in the left rule, we are the client of a channel X that is terminating. And we are basically waiting for this guy to terminate. And then we continue with Q. So again, our, the session that we're offering can be an arbitrary session because we're communicating to the left. We're not communicating along our offering channel in this step of communication. 
Okay, so again, after in the continuation queue, after that uh, session has terminated, we basically lose access to that channel. So we have lost X. Okay, so those people among you who are familiar with uh, linear logic might wonder what about the units for external and internal choice. And in this, in this computational interpretation, we restrict external and internal choice to be at least consisting of one label, just because it's computationally more interesting. I mean, what would be an empty choice, right? Okay, so now let's look at the so-called judgmental rules. So if we take a step back, so far, we've only um, looked at connectives and types that describe actually communication steps, right? But you might ask yourself, well, how do we get started, right? Because, well, we don't just start with a bunch of processes, but there also has to be a way for us to create processes in our system. And those kind of rules that don't communicate or don't describe a communication between two processes, they are so-called judgmental rules. And there are two such rules. Uh, one of them is called cut. So it has in linear logic, uh, cut has a special status. And in an operational interpretation here in a session type setting, we interpret cut as spawning a new process. So let's explore the typing of this cut rule together. All right. So here we are a process that is spawning another process. So as we can see, that's basically this part here where we say, okay, we spawn this code P that should be now run by another process. And we expect to contact that new process that we're spawning at that, that runs P at channel X. And then we, re we resume in Q with Q. And again, because we're not communicating along our offering channel in the continuation, the session type remains C. Okay, so while Let's explore what, what happens above the line. So we have to fill in the blanks here. Um, well, obviously, if we spawn a process, then in our continuation, we want to be able to communicate with that process. So there has to be a channel along which we can contact that process. And that's precisely that channel X here. So this means that in our continuation, in our linear context, we have a channel X of the type of the session that is offered by this process P. All right. What I would like to point out is that this process that we're spawning runs in parallel with our process. So spawn really denotes parallel composition. So, and this is really the cornerstone of concurrency, right? Because when we spawn another process, that process will run in parallel with ours. And uh, in another way to look at it is basically that things that are run in parallel are, uh, are running on, on the various processes. But then when we look at an individual process, we can reason about, uh, about it sequentially. And the only ways of synchronization are by communication when we exchange messages with another process. So a process might be waiting to receive a message from us, or we might be waiting if we are, we are using a synchronous semantics to send a message to another process so that it's ready. Okay. All right, so Scott is really where concurrency happens, where we introduce concurrency in the, in the, in the system. And in a PyCalc, uh, that is basically parallel composition. It's usually P pi Q denoted by that in the pi calculus. Okay, so now we have basically this other new process that we have spawned here above the rule. Now the question is, well, okay, here below we have basically 
a bunch of linear channels and I'm abbreviating them, some that are in delta one and some that are in delta two. And now let's imagine, so maybe this process P needs some of our channels, right? So we are inclined to give it to, the, to that process. However, because we want to make sure that we're not screwing up uh, the, the ownership model that we want to, to, to establish here, we cannot give some channels to P and keep them. Okay, so what we have to do is basically we can say, okay, I'm okay, I'll give you some, some channels, I'm no longer going to use them, and I keep, uh, I keep the remaining, remaining channels to myself. So what is important here is that we have to split the context. So we cannot basically give something away and still keep it. If we give it away, we give it away and it's lost for us. Okay, so then there's another fundamental rule and that's called identity in, in linear logic. And uh, computationally, we can think of it as forwarding or delegation. So essentially, the idea is very simple. Let's say I'm, um, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm right now lecturing, right? But actually, I'm a little bit lazy. Uh, I'd rather go outside and enjoy the day. It's, it's very beautiful outside. So let's imagine um, I have my friend here behind the door. And my friend is actually capable of doing the same job as I do. So what I'll do is I say, I'll forward to, it, to, to that guy. I tell you, okay, I'm going out here and my friend comes in and takes over. Okay, so that's the idea of forwarding. So here we are a process that offers a session A along channel X. And we're forwarding now to a Y. So obviously we need to have that Y in our context. So here we need to have a Y that must exactly provide the same session as we do. Otherwise forwarding was, wouldn't work, right? So my friend that is going to step in for me has to be capable of exactly delivering the same lecture as I do. Okay, so now you might wonder what about other uh, any other possible channels that that uh, this process is using. Well, again, we do not want this to happen, right? We have to insist that once we are forwarding and we're basically just going away or terminating and just handing over to, to the other process, then we have to make sure that there are no other processes or channels that we still that we're still using. Because otherwise, if we'll forward, then those other providers will become orphans. And we again, do not want that. Okay, so these are now all the typing rules um, for linear logic that I want to discuss with you right now. And I think it's now a bit time to maybe um, do an example together. Uh, so there's uh, basically that the, the the, the process terms that I've used so far in the inference rule, they're the process terms of a formal language, which is called SIL. To be honest, I was thinking the other day what it stands for. I don't remember anymore. So there was, a, I can later on provide uh, some papers uh, to it. I, I think it's, or maybe sessions in, in session intuitive, intuitionistic linear logic or something like that, I guess uh, it stands for. But anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to my iPad. Oops, now I lost everyone. Okay. And then um, we're going to explore that together. So I just have to get that going here. So give me a second. Uh, all right. So now I can here uh, share my iPad screen and then I have to light. Okay, zoom. All right, so can you see this uh, this screen here? And yeah, I guess you can see it, right? Okay, otherwise speak up. <laughs> All right. Okay, so 
Um, unfortunately, there is no way for me to, to uh, share my iPad and another screen on my, my computer because otherwise I, we could have like the typing rules next to it. But I, since I provided you the handout, I would suggest that you look at the handout for the typing rules. And so what my goal is now here, so I started already writing that up, but now we will write down the code together. Um, and so what I have here is basically for us as a reminder, I have here the Q session type. And then I want to briefly sketch with you how I want to imp implement this Q. Okay, so basically, uh, I, I think that's a really good exercise because we have to think a little bit differently, right? Because when you look at, um, at the session type here, we have this internal choice where we as a provider have to signal whether we are empty or not, okay? So somehow our code has to distinguish a queue that doesn't contain any elements from a queue that contains elements. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to implement two processes. Uh, here I have the signature of a process definition. So I'm actually going to use here process definition just for simplicity. So here I have an empty process. Uh, I'm going to tell you how to read that, okay? But for now, that's the name of this process definition that we're going to write, an empty one. And then here on the next page, I have an element uh, process here. So, okay, so now going back here to this little sketch here. This is basically how I want to implement the queue. So as we've seen earlier, basically we're going to implement the queue as a kind of a linked list of its elements or the, the queue processes. But in order for me to make the distinction, I will have uh, represent basically an empty queue with a so-called empty process. And for those of you, you might have heard of this idea of a sentinel, right? So rather than having like a, the end of the list point to null, we have a special kind of sentinel element that signifies the end of the list and the empty list, okay? So here I have an empty process. And then if the queue is not empty for each element in the queue, we have an element process, okay? And so here actually in this example, because the queue is polymorphic in um, the queue is polymorphic in a type A. So really in order to complete the picture, so basically now those guys will have a reference to another process, which would uh, sorry, which would be the, the element stored in the queue. Okay, so these are all going to be of type A. All right. Okay, so now let's first uh, try to write together the, the code for the empty process. So briefly how to write this thing. So this is basically the signature of the process definition. And then after the sign he, uh, equal sign, we write the body of the process. So here is the name. And what we do in this language still uh, is basically we separate the type definitions from the name bindings. Uh, so here you can really read this almost like a judgment. So it means we're writing now a process that offers a long chan a channel Q, a session of type QA. The name of the process is empty and its linear context is empty uh, when it starts, okay? And then here we just um, have only the names, okay? So we offer along a, sesh, uh, along a channel Q and uh, the, the process name again is repeated. Okay, so let's now start the uh, writing the body here of this uh, process. Well, okay, when we look at the session type, we see that the first thing, the first communication that happens is that we're going to receive a message from the client. So the client is either going to send us NQ or DQ, which means when you look at the external left right, uh, uh, sorry, external choice left rule, uh, right rule, sorry, then you can see that we have to employ a case statement. Okay, so let, let's write that. So now here in the body of the code, we are going to case uh, on Q, 
And then we'll basically have for each label a branch. So we could either receive the NQ message, and I'm now letting a little bit space, or we can receive the DQ message, right? So let's now provide the code in, in, in each case that we are going to execute. Okay, so after we have received, let's first look at the NQ. After we have received the NQ message, now what happens next? Well, we're going to receive an element from the client. Okay, so now we have to say, okay, I am receiving a long channel Q. Um, so let me just write that code. So a long channel Q, we're receiving something and bind that to X. Okay, so maybe also, uh, or, or let's do that afterwards. We can uh, have a look at the types, how they change. Okay, so now we have received that element. So we were an empty Q, which means that at this point, we just consisted of a process like this, the Sentinel process. But what we have to do next is basically, we have to create an element process that will contain the element that is stored and then basically package everything up, right? Okay, so let's do that. The next thing what we are going to do is we spawn an empty process. So actually we're going to spawn a new Sentinel, all right? And now we are going to spawn the new element process and give it as input. And now I should briefly show you the signature for the element process, which is down here. So the element process is a process that offers a session of type QA along channel Q. And it has two arguments. So two uh, channels in its context. Once it's, uh, it's a teeth, the tail of the queue, and X, the element that it stores. Okay, so that means when we spawn a new element process up here, we now give it as the first argument, the new sentinel, which is E. And then as the next argument, the tail of the queue, which is, um, uh, I'm sorry, the first one was the tail of the queue, which is E, which is the new sentinel, and then just uh, the new argument that we want to store that we have received earlier. Okay, and now we basically forward, uh, now we basically spawn this again at channel Q. All right, so what we've done is really, I, I can write that here to the left, what we've done is we transitioned from an empty, empty process to one where we have an empty one and an element one, which now has access to X like this. That's what we've done. All right. So now let's look at the DQ message. Well, when we receive the DQ message, we have to indicate whether we're empty or not. Well, in case we were empty, right, we'll have to send the message none because we're still empty. So we're going to do that. And then what we have to do next is we have to terminate. So we are going to say close Q. Okay. So all right, so I guess um, let's maybe briefly have a look at the types, how they change, right? So when we start out here, basically, the type of channel Q is QA. All right. So after we, re we case on Q, at this point, what is the type of Q? Well, the type of Q at this point is the external, uh, no, right. It's the external choice, right? So it's a external choice, blah, 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 blah. All right. So after we receive the NQ label, it's going to be, well, uh, let me write the type after we've executed both statements here. So after we receive the NQ label and then we receive, do this receive. 
So at this point, the type of the Q is again, um, maybe I should also, let me write the judgment. So we have here, and I'm going to also make some room here. Oops. All right. Okay, so here Q is going to be of type QA. But what is interesting is also that after this receive, we have now a channel XA in our context. Okay, and I encourage you really to go through this and uh, go through this exercise and think about at every point in time, what, what, uh, what's in our context, what are the types of the channels and also what is the type of the offering channel and look at the typing rules. Um, there's the handout that I provided to you and then try to see whether type checking is successful. So it, it takes a little mental exercise at first and then in the, you know, over a after a few exercises, you're very quick and you can basically do the type checking on the fly. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the case where the queue is actually not empty and let's briefly go through that code also. Okay, so um, again, uh, so we're, the only difference is that we now have a tail, um, which is the remainder uh, of the queue and an element, the X that is, uh, that we are storing, okay? So again, because it's an external choice, we have to first case on our offering channel, case Q off, all right? And then again, we have two cases to distinguish. Either we receive an NQ label, and then let me maybe scroll up a little bit. Uh, and then I write here the DQ label, oops. Uh, DQ label. All right. So let's first fill in the NQ branch. All right. So again, we'll receive a new element, right? We receive and we bind that to Y. And now um, we have to figure out what to do with it, right? So going back to our uh, as a figure up here, remember that we decided to basically DQ from the front and to NQ from the back, okay? And we have to do it this way because we are in a linear system because there is not the possibility to have basically a pointer to the front and a pointer to the back uh, of the list because that would violate linearity, okay? Because here, this guy would now have two, two incoming edges, okay? So that's why we basically have, what we have to do is if we NQ a message or an element, we'd have to basically pass it down the list until it hits the empty element, okay? So, what are we going to do after we've received that? Well, what we are going to do is we are going to send our tail the NQ message. And then we are going to send to our tail the element that we've just received, okay? And then we are just going to recurse. So we're, we're not changing, we are still keep, we are still storing the same element that we started out with. Okay, so what if we are receiving a DQ message? Well, of course we have to signal whether we're, we're empty or not. So obviously we're the element process indicating that it's a non-empty queue. There's at least one element. So we are going to send the message some and now we'll have to basically DQ the element, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to send along our offering channel Q the element X. And now we basically have to terminate, right? And we want to tell the client to talk to the remainder of the queue. Well, that's exactly forwarding, right? 
So we are now forwarding our channel Q to the tail of the queue, and henceforth the client will talk to the tail. Okay, so um, I guess I'll briefly ask whether there are any questions with this way of implementing the queue. There are some, but I think uh, I was able to locally answer them, but okay. if people have questions, feel free to type them out now and I can uh, tell Stephanie. <laughs> Well, uh, Tuta is doing an amazing job of monitoring and responding to questions. So <laughs> I hope he must be drained after the lecture. <laughs> okay, so then I'll, let me go back to my slides in this case. Um, so, and I'm going to share again my screen. All right, and then I can... All right, so we did this and let me actually move my iPad over here. Okay, so now let me uh, tell you a little bit more about the connection to linear logic, because what we've done so far is basically employed this idea of ownership, which is really what linear logic achieves at the end of the day, but we've experimented with it uh, empirically if you want, right? Driven on an example and just taking this idea in, having this idea in our mind and, and trying to establish that. Okay, so, but actually there's more to it because I've made a big deal of saying like, these are logic-based uh, session types, right? Linear session types. So, well, what do I mean by this? Well, actually, if you take the rules, the typing rules that we've, Kind of developed together so far and you just erase the process terms and the channel names then you just get the linear logic uh, rules okay so let's explore that at an example and then i just encourage you to do the same exercise with all the other rules if you're new to linear logic i just ask you to accept that if you have heard, if you are familiar with linear logic, that might be very interesting and maybe you already know about it. Okay, so here on the left, I have the internal choice. And so now let's do this exercise, right? I just said that, well, basically get rid of the process terms and also get rid of the channel names. And then we really get the corresponding rules in linear logic. And you can double check in intuitionistic linear logic, these are the rules on the right for, uh, for internal choice. Okay, so what I would like to point out is that so far in the development, I used basically so-called what is in the pi calculus referred to, now I have to not screw that up. I think it's called free output, okay? So basically in, in, the, in the tensor and lolly rules, the, the sender had a channel available in its context and basically just sent that channel. But if we want to see the correspondence to logic nicely, we have to rewrite that rule, okay? So here's the, the right rule for tensor, all right? So as I pointed out before, so here we actually have what we're sending along our offering channel X, we're sending the channel Y, and we actually have here a channel Y in the context. And then we only get one premise in the rule. All right, but we actually can easily rewrite that using spawn and forwarding, all right? So here what I'm doing is basically, I am spawning this process here. This process runs the code forward C to Y, and it's running, it's, it's offering this, this little program at a channel C, right? And you see that I have Y here in my context. And what it means is we're getting here this other premise, which is just the identity rule, which is an axiom. So it's, it's, uh, we get that for free. And when we now erase the process terms here, we get exactly uh, the rule in linear logic for the tensor right rule. All right. So I just wanted to point that out in case you go through the exercise of erasing the process terms and then 
you don't get the for for tensor and lolly don't get the corresponding rules. All right. Okay, so there's a theory behind this. Um, and that's the so called Curry Howard correspondence. So I know that Chuto gave a, a talk earlier, just before my session where he talked, I presumably, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend it, uh, the Curry Howard correspondence too. And I'm pretty sure that many of you already heard of the Curry Howard correspondence. But usually when we refer to that, we have the famous Curry Howard correspondence in mind between is, which is between intuitionistic logic and the lambda calculus. Okay, so basically a, a logically motivated or logic, logic foundation for functional programming. All right. So this Curry Howard correspondence here was also discovered. Uh, I have some references for that, but this correspondence is between linear logic and the session typed pi calculus. All right. And basically it's so that there, there are papers on this. I will provide you the references, but what it really is, it's, um, it's actually Robert Harper has refers to this also as Trinitarianism, uh, which is basically that there's, it's the observation. Trinitarianism actually don't, not only relates logic with type theory, but also logic type theory and category theory. And the observation is, wow, there are concepts in logic, they have a counterpart in type theory, oh, and they even have a counterpart in category theory, all right? And that's a really nice thing, why? Because it provides you some guidelines. If you are working on a new programming language and you kind of stay, take logic as a guide, you kind of know that you're not going to screw up, right? And it's, it also means that like it's, it gives it some fundamental uh, importance, right? That you have a concept over here and that concept is related to some, something over there. There must be really something to it. All right, so what does this correspondence here mean? By the way, also curry Howard correspondence, people refer to as propositions as types. And I personally like that a lot because curry Howard is, a, it's, it, it, these observations have been made by more people than just Curry and Howard. So it's probably a good, good idea to call it props as types. All right, so specifically for the Curry Howard correspondence, okay, I'll stick with Curry Howard correspondence, but the correspondence that we are looking at here, it's between logic and type theory, meaning that in our sense, it means that linear propositions correspond to session types. We've already seen that, right? When we erase the, the process terms and just leave the, uh, the, 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 the connectives uh, standing. Uh, then it also establishes the correspondence between proofs and programs. Uh, you can see this when you look at the process terms, you could also view those as proof terms and then you have an entire derivation. So basically uh, the program amounts to the de type, typing derivation. And then there's also this idea of cut reduction, which uh, corresponds to com communication. Cut reduction is a concept I'm not going to go into. I'm happy to provide references, pointers, but it's a local validity condition of a logic. And you can see that when you look at the cut reduction for each connective, basic cut reduction brings the left rule and right rule together. You can see that uh, that corresponds to one step of communication. Okay, so now the promised uh, citations. So this correspondence was first discovered by Louis Kairish and Frank Fenning, and that was at the Concur conference published in 2010. Louis and Frank have worked out this correspondence for intuitionistic linear logic. So their correspondence holds true between intuitionistic linear logic and the session type pi calculus. Phil Wadler then later in uh, uh, 2012 at ICFP has established that correspondence for classical, uh, classical linear logic. And so um, uh, I refer you to those papers uh, and I'm just remarking here now that in 
this presentation and, and kind of that line of work that I'm presenting here will focus on the curry howard correspondence between intuitionistic linear logic and the session type pi calculus. All right. So you might wonder now, what are really the benefits? I said, well, it's, it's a nice thing, right? It's, it, it's like a good, it's like, like a moral compass or like a conceptual compass, right? Can I interrupt for a question? Sure. Uh, cut reduction is not the same as cut elimination as in Genton's hop steps, is that correct? Yes. But uh, basically in the cut elimination proof, you use cut reduction, okay? All right. Uh, if people, I have, I can um, uh, give references if people want to know more. But cut elimination is also interesting because it, it kind of it's it's like when you have cut elimination, you also get deadlock freedom. Okay, just for free. Okay, so uh, so let me be a bit more precise about what the benefits are. Uh, basically, what the benefits of linear logic are for programming. Um, all right. So basically, we've already, when we devised the typing rules, we were very careful about treating, basically employing this idea of ownership. So, um, well, linear logic can be viewed, or some people refer to it as a logic of resources, and will now inhale that a little bit uh, meaning. But uh, what the good news is that you already have now, you already have seen all of this. I'll just provide you the term and then you can show off with your colleagues and throw those, drop those terms, all right? So linear logic is referred to as a so-called substructural logic because it rejects the certain structural rules, okay? So when you have a hypothetical judgment, the notion of hy hypothetical entailment, there are some basic uh, properties that you want to hold true. And the structure rules are those rules that make sense in a lot of logics, all right? Uh, any logic will always um, support reflexivity, right? But then there are some other structure rules that can be up for grabs. So those two in particular, uh, there, there are two rules in particular, which actually linear logic does not support, actually rejects it doesn't want to have it, all right? And these are weakening and contraction, all right? So let me show you how, what, what that means. Well, if we define a logic or we have like a type system, then we can, if we want, support weakening and contraction, either as explicit rules or have it so-called admissible. So we basically built it into the type system. And I'll show you also how, how that that look, looks like. All right, well, okay, so you might wonder, oh gosh, now she's showing me those rules, I have no idea what that means. But there's actually a very simple way to read those. Okay, so what does the, the rule, the weakening rule on, on the left say? Well, as you can see, we're now again using the sequent calculus interpretation, we read it from bottom up and we're going to read it as a process, all right? So essentially here, we have currently access to a resource A, but we don't have it anymore in the continuation. But basically what we can license us to do is to drop a resource on the floor. We're not consuming it, we'll just drop it and continue. And in linear logic, we don't want that, all right? Contraction on the other hand is a way for us to duplicate a resource. So as you can see here in the conclusion, we have access to an A, and then we just say, oh, well, I'm, I'm just creating another one. And in my continu continuation, I have now two. Okay, so what does that give us as a result? If we do not permit weakening, then we are guaranteed that every provider has at least one client. Right? Because if we were allowed to do that, then we would have orphan, pro orphan providers, okay? Well, without contraction, we have like, we cap it now on the other end. We will make sure that every client has at most one, uh, every provider has at most one client, 
right? Because if we were allowed to do that, for example, in Spawn, we could keep some channels and give them also away to someone else. Okay, so in summary, and that's a slogan you hear very often, it's this exactly once. So it means that every provider has exactly one client. As a side note, you have heard certainly of affine logics. Actually, Rust has a affine type system. And Soares will tell you that that caused quite some headache for him because he wanted to enforce linearity by typing, all right? Okay, so what is an affine type system? An affine type system is a system that does, uh, does not allow contraction, but it does support weakening. So that means that we can create aliases, but we can simply drop a resource on the floor. We don't have to consume it. Okay, so let's click, uh, briefly revisit our, some of our typing rules and see in the rule where we can identify the absence of weakening and contra contraction. All right, so let's look at this rule, which is the right rule for one. So we are terminating. Here it's precisely, you can see that we don't have weakening because we are forcing that every resource that we used has to be consumed, used up before we terminate. Otherwise we will create orphans. So here we're not allowed to drop any resource. And as a such, every provider has at least one client. Okay, so now let's look at the cut rule. This rule is where we are basically seeing that we do not have contraction in our type system. If we had contraction, then we could feed both the delta one and delta two to both P and Q. But because we don't have contraction, we have to uh, basically split the context. We're not allowed to duplicate any resources. And you can really think of contraction as the rule, if, if contraction is allowed in our type system, that's the thing that creates aliases. Okay, so you, we have a new term for aliasing, right? It's all due to contraction. Okay, and so now basically that makes sure that every provider has at most one client. All right. Um, then I would like to point something well, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing again, but now we're exploring what are the consequences of not having weakening and contraction for the runtime structures that we create when we execute the program. Okay, as a matter of fact, so we saw that a, a process, a, a session type program will result in a bunch of processes that, that, that execute and exchange with messages, right, along channels. So we have basically, in principle, a graph of processes at runtime. That's our program, all right? Well, what happens is now that we do not have contraction and we don't have weakening, so we have a, we enforce linearity. As a result of this, we get a tree at runtime. So our process graph forms a tree. So it's an acyclic graph. Okay, and the, that's actually important and why we'll see next. But let me briefly point out to you that if we have an intuitionistic linear type system, then our tree structure is directed, right? That's the difference to classical linear logic in terms of the runtime structures. So let me explain to you why it's directed. It's because we have an intuitionistic sequence where we basically have one thing on the right and we don't have dualization. So in classical linear logic, we have the Morgan duality. So we have perp, we can dualize a type. I'm now speaking to the people who have heard of this, which allows us to basically move from the left and the right, from the left to the right and, uh, okay, left to the right and the right to the left of the turnstile. In intuitionistic logic, we don't have that possibility, but as, in, in basically by that we gain something. We have a finer distinction 
we can now basically distinguish a parent node from its child node, all right? So you can see here, basically, I have the typing judgment. This is the process that we're looking at, that's this guy. And this process is the provider to some other client that, uh, that listens along X. But the process itself uses those channels X1 to Xn, and they are its children. So it's a very, very um, helpful abstraction, especially when we then reason about deadlock in a, in a shared session type setting where we allow aliasing. It's very helpful to have this abstraction of a tree structure, of a directed tree structure to think about the runtime structures that we get when we run the programs, because properties like deadlocks are all about, they're, they're highly dynamic, right? Okay. So, as I said, we're going to use that, that, the, the fact that in an intuitionistically typed setting, the, the graph, the tree structure is directed. Uh, but by the way, the directedness, I also indicate here with this little bubble here, which it really denotes the side of the provider. Okay, so that's the provider. This is, is, is the client. All right. Okay, so, well, the reason now, so we, we had a, made, made a big deal of using linearity, right? And our intuition was in the beginning, if we restrict aliasing, we should probably be fine uh, with regard to type safety. And it's actually true. Type safety really falls out very easily. So we have here, basically, as I said, uh, in, a, in a linear session type system, we get a tree structure at runtime. And now when you think about preservation, well, preservation really holds uh, almost immediately just by the fact that every provider has a unique client. So now we are guaranteed that the client, when the client communicates with the provider, it's the only client. So there's no other client that will interfere. So the client always has a, the correct uh, perception of what the type is of the provider. So by basically linearity, we can easily prove preservation. So now what about deadlocks? Okay, and now I have a very nice way to explain that to you, I think. I'm, I'm really proud of it. I hope you're going to enjoy that because it actually took me quite a while to figure that. <laughs> but it, it's really important uh, when once we, we reason about deadlocks. So I will reuse that uh, picture here. But anyway, so what about progress? Well, you know, we have a message passing system, which means that it's not the case that at every point in time, a process will be doing something, right? Because processes exchange messages with each other, which mean that they might be waiting for, for another process to talk to it. So we have two possible threats to progress. In a, in a message passing system, which are the following. Either it can be the case that the provider is ready to synchronize, but the client is not, or the client is ready to synchronize and the provider is not, right? So, and, and here, by the way, I'm, I'm assuming a synchronous semantics where both receive and, and send are blocking, but um, an asynchronous semantics has is a little bit more flexible, but also uh, we have the same considerations. So let's go with the synchronous semantics where either the provider can be waiting or the client can be waiting, all right? And let's now visualize this waiting dependency here with this green arrow where I'm connecting two nodes in the tree, so two processes when, with a green arrow from A to B, if A is waiting to synchronize with B. So that can be, you know, like I want to, to receive, I'm waiting to receive a message from someone, but this other process is right now busy to uh, talking to someone else. All right, so I'm blocked, I have to wait. Okay, so let's visualize those waiting dependencies in the tree. Well, as you can see, there's actually no way that we can ever form a cyclic dependency, waiting dependency, because those green arrows, denote synchronizations that go along linear channels. 
So the linear channels are the edges in the tree structure. And there's no way for us to close a cycle just by going along the edges in a, in a tree. Okay. So progress in a linear succession type system based on logic, uh, we need uh, special properties with regard to cut. But anyway, a logically motivated linear succession type system will uh, be deadlock free from the get go. Okay. So now uh, let me introduce you to some way of how we can formalize that a little bit uh, so that if you go to research papers and look at them that you kind of understand what's going on. All right. So, um, well, you've heard uh, presumably in the lecture by Robert Harper about type safety. Mm. And I'm sure that many of you are to some extent familiar with it. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what type safety is, it expresses basically a coherence between the statics that we develop for a, a language, so the type system, and the dynamics of a language. And the dynamics describes uh, basically how programs transitions, transition. So it mimics the execution of a program. It's a formal model to reason about the execution of a program. And so a, a, type safe, a type safe language basically says, well, well type programs cannot go wrong. All right. So now we have to figure out how to state that precisely in our message passing context. Because if you have had been exposed previously, it's probably more in a functional slash imperative language. OK. So in order to do that, we first have to define the dynamics of our language, which we haven't done yet. So briefly, let me explain you what kind of formalism I'm using or what kind of techniques I'm using. I'm basically going to use multi-set rewriting rules, and they have the following form. So, well, we have to basically capture how a runtime structure changes state, I mean, transitions from one stage to the next one, right? And our session type programs yield a bunch of processes at runtime that actually, as we know, form a tree. And we can express that basically, we, we kind of abstract that by abstracting a process uh, with this predicate proc. Uh, I actually have some animations for this, so now I have to be careful before I go ahead and explain everything without the animations. So, so basically, the way how we read those rules is we have here this left arrow. It says, we'll take the pre-state here and rewrite it to the post-state here, OK? So we actually only describe what we are changing, and anything else we leave, leave, leave unchanged, OK? So that's a very convenient way of describing a change locally. So really, we have a bunch of processes. So we have a bunch of those prop predicates. Uh, but in a transition, we're only describing those who get transformed. OK, so here on the left, we have basically the state before the rewrite. And then on the right, we have the state after the rewrite. OK, and yeah, here are my animations. So the way how I write those rules is I have basically here a provider process and a client process. OK, so the provider and client, they communicate and transition together. OK, and then here when we dive into uh, this predicate here, so the first argument, so to speak, is the, the name of the offering channel that we have at runtime. So here we have a process that offers along a channel A. And we can see that this is the code that it's executing. So here I'm basically just indicating that this process is communicating along channel A. And then analogously here for the client that offers along a channel C, C it is communicating uh, along channel A, all right? And then they both transitions to P prime and Q prime, okay? So now let's look at, so that, that's kind of our rule schema if you want. And now let's look at selected rules. Okay, so for tensor, well, 
As you can see here, we have a providing process that offers along channel A and it's sending the channel B along its offering channel A and then it continues with B. And then here we have the client that is willing to receive along channel A, binds it to Y and then continues with Q where Y is bound. And that will transition to the provider just running its continuation P and the client running its continuation Q, but now substituting the received channel B for the variable Y. Okay, so now for, um, let's look at external choice. Here I have actually generalized the choice already to anary choices. So we have the provider that is waiting to receive along channel A, uh, and I have, a, I have a typo here, that should be an A. I'm going to change that, all right? This X should be an A. So I'm casing, the provider is casing on channel A and it's willing to receive any of the label Ls and then it will continue with the P. The client on the other hand is going to pick one label. So L sub K is, and will continue with Q. And as we can see now, the provider in the post step runs the K continuation P and the client the continuation Q. And then for termination, the provider is closing the channel, the client is waiting uh, for the client to close. And then afterwards, we only have the client left and the provider is gone. Then for cut, we have a process that is spawning a process P along channel X. And now in the continuation, we have a new channel A, a process that offers along that channel A and is ru now running P with the channel A substituted for the variable X. And then for the client continues with Q now with A substituted for X. And for identity, we basically just, when we forward A to B, we just uh, cease to exist and we go globally substitute B for A. Okay, so I want to point out that this is a synchronous dynamics. Uh, which means that both the send and the receive are blocking. We could easily write that to an asynchronous semantics. And in such a setting, we would basically spawn off any message that is being sent and then link them together with forwards. Uh, but uh, it's easier um, formalization wise in, certain, in a certain regard. So I, I chose a synchronization, uh, synchronous semantics here for you. All right, so now we have the type system we have the dynamics, but what we need in addition is we have to be able to type our configuration of processes that result at runtime. Okay, so we'll have to talk about the configuration typing. Well, for those of you who are familiar with imperative languages, um, the config configuration typing here really amounts to the heap typing in imperative languages. So if we have pure languages, a lambda calculus without any side effects. At runtime, we just have values. But in any uh, programming language where we have effects, we have runtime structures that get created. So allocation, if you want, spawning of a process is just allocation, it's like memory allocation, all right? So in order to do the preservation proof, we'll have to reason about those runtime structures and being able to type them. Okay, so in order to type our, uh, our trees that we get or our process tree that we get, we use the following two typing rules. All right, so the first rule basically just said, um, or, or let me read to you the typing judgment first. So here we're basically, I'm using here a different turnstile symbol. And this here is basically just a number of pro processes. Okay, it's a configuration of processes where I single, one, uh, single out one process and then the remaining uh, processes are just referred to as omega. And then I say what those processes offer. And as you can see in one premise, it's an inductive definition. We are typing omega using the same kind of typing judgment, but we also require that there is a valid process term derivation for the P, the code P that we are running. Okay it's easier to illustrate that with a picture, all right? What those two or 
this inductively de defined configuration typing system allows us to do is really, it allows us to type forests, all right? Because as you can see here on the right, I basically have a forest. And, and the reason why we need a forest is if we basically inductively take a tree apart, we get forests, right? Take a tree, peel off the root, you get a forest. All right, so actually, let's visualize how this tree connects to this root. So in order, uh, this forest, sorry, in order to type this, we use really here the second rule. So actually, as it turns out, this here really amounts to the omega that we have. And this process here is that guy over here that we have. As you can see, this P offers, now we'll go above the rule, uh, above the line, this process P offers a long channel A, a session of type A. So that's that channel A here. And it's using channels in D1. All right. So D1 is really the B, C, and D that we have here. And while there are some other leftover channels, which are the D2, the, the delta 2, that are offered by the remaining configuration, which just amounts to the channel E. Okay, so as you can see, is basically we arrange the typing such that if we have a process, if we basically add a process to an existing sub configuration, we require that all the channels that this process requires is already to the left in the configuration. So we kind of, um, I think it's a dead first traverse or so of, of, of the forest, of the tree, okay? Uh, what I would like to point out is at the top level, we basically get a configuration for a closed pro program, we get a configuration that just has the, the root basically is the main process that just offers uh, a session of type one, which means it's basically a process that waits to be, that, that spawns other processes, right? So we start with the main process. It starts other processes that all become children in the tree. They all communicate and then finally close up until we have back one process. And then that guy waits to be terminated by the operating system. All right. So let's talk about uh, preservation and progress now. All right. So basically preservation, we can now state as follows. Well, if we have a well-typed configuration omega that offers some, some deltas, and this omega takes a step to omega prime, then that remaining configuration or that, that new configuration omega prime has to still offer the same, same, same uh, sessions. Okay, so it might be puzzling at first, right, to read this statement because if you like look in a lambda calculus, we have like E, e is, is of type tau, E steps to E prime, then E prime is of type uh, tau. Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll take that back. <laughs> I, I wanted to point out that it's actually in, in sync, but it might be surprising because you might expect things to change, right? Because in a session type system, when a communication step happens, um, uh, the types of channel can change. But actually we are able to state um, the, the, the preservation such that we can uh, capture what remains invariant. So in particular here, the Delta is really about the channels that are currently that currently have no communication partner. And so it means that because there's no communication partner, they, they will remain uh, the same. However, everything and any communication that happens really happens in, in the lower parts of the tree. And those channels are not exposed as part of the interface. Okay, so now let's look at progress. Well, progress we can state as follows. If we have a well-typed configuration omega, then it is either a case that it can take a step to omega prime or omega is poised. Well, you're used to a formulation of progress which says either can take a step or it's a value. 
So what is a value in a functional language is poised in this setting. Well, what does poised really mean? Well, poised means that every uh, process in the configuration is poised. And a poised process is really a process that is ready to synchronize along its offering channel. So it's basically a process that is, you know, stalled along its offering channel. So if every process is poised in the entire configuration, then we get something like this, basically. You see? So the configuration is really waiting to interact along its external interface, which is here along A and E. And as long and it cannot take any internal steps. Okay. So uh, let me take stock. Uh, I have some more material, but uh, time is up. So let me just take stock. So to summarize, we've now uh, worked out a linear session type uh, language. Um, we have explored together that this language, because it's based on uh, linear, linear logic session types, it guarantees session fidelity and deadlock freedom. And we've explored the connection also to intuitionistic linear logic. And um, one thing that we haven't looked at, which if you are familiar with linear logic, you will notice that there is one connective that is missing so far, which is, which is the so-called persistent, persistent truth. So these are the connectives that we looked at. And bang A is missing so far. That's also re um, um, referred to as of course. And uh, so since it's now at 23 past uh, in my time, six o'clock in Oregon time, three o'clock, uh, I, I will uh, stop here. What I will decide is either I will, um, I guess we'll briefly talk about it in any case, persistence. And then next time for sure, we're going to talk about sharing. But I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about sharing. So I might cut it a little bit short, but the material is there anyway, and I will ex I will provide that in any case. All right. Um, okay. okay, so that's from my side. So I'm happy to take any questions. So I had two reference related questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one was asking for a reference of um, I guess a recommended reference of um, sequence calculus. I intuition as a proposition was linear logic, just a sequence calculus question. Okay. Um, yeah. But... Right. Uh, I'm happy to provide that. Um, I will um, take a note. I can, so... I can also send it to you if it's easier, whichever. Uh, oh, okay. That's, uh, I, I'll, I'll make a note. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so there's really, uh, Frank Fenning has on his website wonderful lecture notes, and I would really highly recommend those. I will uh, provide a link in, in Slack. Okay. I recommend those too. <laughs> um, and the other reference that I was asked for was um, the syntax of SIL. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, all right. So, actually, I think I have a. Um, let me briefly see, I'm going to screen share again. Now I almost hit the leaf button, that wouldn't be good. Uh, let me see, uh, all right, so, oops. Um, I have something here, which, uh, I mean, there are some, um, okay, now, okay, so let me see, where did I put that? Um, I have this, I did that, right. Here's an overview that might actually be helpful, but that was, uh, there's another implementation apart for ferrite. We also have concurrency not, um, which I'm not going to explore with you in, in at OPLSS this time because we have ferrite, which is really very, very cool. But here's uh, an overview of the syntax. So I could provide that if that would be helpful. And then otherwise also, there are some research papers, but research papers often do not provide the, you know, a complete overview. 
All right. Okay, so uh, Joe has a question. Um, I was just wondering, um, you, you know, the book you mentioned by Milner, the, the very short book. Yes. Um, I, um, I wanted to check like the, the table of contents for it, but like the Google books just has like a bunch of Roman numerals. Um, how much of the how much of that overlaps with kind of just the session types aspect of what we're covering, or is it just the the pi calculus? It's just the pi calculus. Yeah. Okay. But it's uh, actually to be honest, um, the, there's you. So so basically, it's very helpful. It's I forgot. So there's uh, some sections which you might choose to to skip, <laughs> if I may say so, depending on what your uh, use case is. But yeah. I would recommend to look at kind of the calcul pi calculus basics and mm -hmm. also by simulation, uh, mm -hmm. strong, mm -hmm. weak. Uh, it, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very short, but still appeals to intuition. But it's only pi calculus. So uh, it was really Koi Honda who introduced session types. Okay, so is there a good reference for the introduction of session type it's like a good book or good uh okay kind of... yeah that's that's a good question so there um there are various families of session types all right so the the original uh, session types introduced by koi honda and then also there's been lots of work uh since then people kind of the key people in this area are koi honda who uh, sadly died a couple of years ago but he did a lot of work also with his wife, uh, Nobuko Yoshida, uh, and she's still very active. Uh, so basically re, uh, all her descendants, uh, there's a lot of work. Uh, those uh, session types are, there are differences. Uh, they're, they're not, there's not this clear correspondence to linear logic. There are differences in how you program in it and what the expressiveness is. And then there has been this line of research now uh, building on those the curry Haber correspondences. So the line of research starting with Frank Penning and Louis Kairis and descendants in, in the intuitionistic setting. And then also Phil Waller's uh, kind of work and then follow up work uh, in the classical setting. And as such, it's really the that makes it difficult for someone learning about it because you almost have to make a choice what you want to get started with. I think there is a good um, kind of tutorial article by I think Vascos Vasconcelos, uh, just generally about session types, but more I'd say in the flavor of uh, Koe Honda's uh, session types. Yeah, it's, it's just, um, I guess obviously concurrency on its own is so vast, it's hard to navigate, isn't it? It kind is. of work out where you're going. Yeah, right, right. So you can also feel free to send me email later on if you have questions. I'm happy to provide further references. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I have two more. Mm -hmm. uh, one's a, a little question about, um, I, I guess, uh, ask, asking for some intuition on why we cannot have cycles in the linear setting. Yeah. Um, my only response was that was like, look at the rules essentially. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to go beyond that. Uh -huh. Do you have any uh, other interest right. on that? So, so there's, there are different answers to that. Uh, so if you have a linear logic that is based on, um, I'm sorry, if you have session types, linear logic session types, they're based on either Kind of the curry haver correspondence uh, in the intuitionistic setting or classical you get deadlock freedom follows directly from cut elimination so if for those logics you have a cut elimination proof however what i would like to point out is that those logics do not support recursion so there are no recursive types which means as soon as you want to Ha, kind of have a session type language that deals with practical examples, you probably might end up using recursion. Uh, well, there's a way to 
you can do a lot with replication, which which is bang of course that that we haven't uh, that I just wanted to start talking about, but still it's not the same. Uh, so in a setting like this, the 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 no cycle, so the deadlock freedom really follows from the fact that we get a tree structure at drum time. So let me briefly share again that slide. Um, I uh, so where's that? That I think was here. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm what I'm exploring here is that. Um, well, what does a deadlock mean, right? A deadlock means it's a circular waiting dependency, right? So I could be waiting for Chuta to answer in the chat and Ch Chuta is waiting for me to answer a, a, to a question in the chat, all right? And then we're both waiting for each other and we're not doing anything. Okay, so, so basically, at the core is the idea of waiting for, for, for something to happen, right? We're not doing anything right now, we're stalled because we're waiting, okay? And even in a linear session type system that we have here, there's still, it's still the case if we have here a configuration of processes that builds a tree, it's not the case that at every time step, if you want, every process will do something, right? because, well, they're communicating with each other. And it might be that this guy down here wants to talk to its parent, but the parent is right now talking to this guy over here. So as a result, that guy has to wait until the parent is ready to talk, all right? So we do have waiting dependencies also in this setting. And I'm visualizing here the waiting dependencies. So you can think of at runtime, at every point in time. So basically, we have that's a snapshot of a runtime scenario that we have in our system. And when we want to reason about deadlock, we have to think about what are the waiting dependencies. And we have to prove that there's never a waiting dependency that is circular. So here I'm visualizing the waiting dependency with a green arrow. So I'm saying like, what possible waiting dependencies can arise in this system, right? Well, and what I'm saying here is that in this system that we have, a waiting dependency only ever arises along those edges. Why? Okay, so what are those edges? Those edges are the linear channels that connect the processes, right? And because they're linear, it's the case that there, those edges are not circular. They're linear, it's a tree, okay? That's one thing. And the waiting, how I phrase the waiting dependency is, I'm waiting to synchronize with someone else. Well, I'm synchronizing along a linear channel. So I'm waiting, a child is either waiting for its parent or a parent can possibly be waiting for its child. Right? So that means just in terms of visualizing those uh, waiting dependencies, those green arrows, they can only go along those linear edges. And as you can see, there's no way for us to form a cycle because there's nothing that kind of, you know, we could close the cycle by basically connect this guy with this guy over here. But those two cannot be waiting for each other because they're not talking to each other. They're not connected by a, a direct channel. And then also there's no way for, our, for, for, for us to have like a green arrow going this way and a green arrow going that way because if this guy is waiting for that guy and that one for the former, they can go ahead and talk with each other. Okay, so that's a way to kind of visualize or to reason about the possible waiting dependencies that can arise and we can prove that those waiting dependencies cannot be circular. Now imagine once we throw anything into the system, this whole thing becomes a big mess. And then it's precisely possible for us to actually close, uh, close, close the loop. 
but we'll talk about this next or actually in the fourth lecture, I believe. Okay, so was that helpful? I think it was uh, helpful for me, um, hopefully others too, but um, I, I might have misworded the question a bit. Mm -hmm. I think the question also had a little more fundamental um, uh, detail on uh, more about how do we know that a tree is, um, it, it is a tree, I guess. How, how do you know that uh, you can't have, say, two channels that are providing for each other? Right, because, because we don't have weakening and contraction. Uh -huh. that's, that's really the key. It's really contraction. No contraction is really important because then we always have to split. We all, so think of this way. No contraction guarantees that there's at most one client, right? So we basically have ownership and that's exactly a tree because every child has exactly one parent or if you want at most one parent, that's a tree, tree data structure. Uh, so you can see the chat right now, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's an example of that code that uh, Gilamit, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so the second one, we cannot forward, forwarding is always the offering channel to something that we have in on the left. So the Q code, uh, oh, wait a minute, no, I, I read it wrong. Uh, so here the P forwards Y to X and Q forwards X to Y, okay. Um, So yeah, that, that's not, so it cannot be, what cannot be the case. So let me see about that. I have to think about that. Um, so the, the P forwards, uh, P forwards Y to X. Right, that, that would be that uh, you can, that, that basically is a, that isn't a tree structure. The connectivity here is not working in that example. Okay, okay. Um, I'll wait like a couple more seconds in case there's okay. a follow-up. And but people can otherwise, I think people can unmute themselves and go ahead if they want. I think it has to do with the naming because like here um, we are giving it an explicit name. So it depends on how, how we assign the names. Uh, so you're still talking about the chat? The yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not a valid well type configuration. Exactly. Okay, there's one more question and yeah, the person didn't have a mic, so I'll on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, is there an intuition for cut elimination in the session type system? Uh, okay, so the intuition is basically that we find, <laughs> well, there are different ways to put it, but one way to put it is basically it's a, you can think of cut elimination as a terminating algorithm that pushes, so it, it applies cut, cut reduction steps and cut reduction steps are communications. So you basically, you have a terminating algorithm that pushes cut reduction to the leaves. So that means it's a finite a sequence of computation. So it's not, it's not basically non-terminating behavior. And I, I also should point out because I mentioned that basically cut diminution fails when you add in recursive types. So there is work uh, by um, Sam Lindley and Garrett Morris, I believe. It, the paper is called Talking Bananas <laughs> and, and something more is in the title, but I lo love the Talking Bananas part. That's what I remember. Anyway, and uh, they add in um, least, uh, greatest and least fixed points. 
So basically inductive and co-inductive types. And um, so that, um, if I'm not mistaken, they have like a terminating behavior for that calculus. And then there's the thesis work by Karsani Derakshan, where she explores basically coming from circular proofs where she adds in the at least and greatest fixed points and a validity condition. And then you get basically a strong progress result. So it's a form of a cotillination in that setting. Uh, but that imposes restrictions. You just, you do not have generally recursive types. And um, so, so yeah, I guess that's as much as I want to say. <laughs>